Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome tonight Ardit Bondi and her program, A Tale of Many Penguins. Thank you again, Ardit, for being here. Thank you again, Anne. And um, I'll just mention again that since I'm often asked, I took all the photos in this talk with the exception of one taken of me in 1998 with my own camera by an unknown fellow traveler. In 1992, my sister-in-law invited me to join her on a trip to the subantarctic island of South Georgia. And as we approached the first colony of at least 100,000 king penguins, I was completely hooked. By 2018, I was lucky enough to be able to visit the Snow Hill Island Emperor Penguin Colony. There, these Emperor Penguin chicks were being guarded by an adult while their parents were out fishing. In Emperor Penguin Daycare, the chicks follow the leader, as penguins frequently do. Safety in numbers is the rule for most penguin species, and for chicks, following adults keeps them from getting isolated from the colony, which would make them vulnerable to flying predators like the kelp gull that just flew by, or skuas, or giant petrels. Penguins, like these Adeles on the Antarctic Peninsula, are considered an indicator species for the overall health of the marine ecosystem. Their presence and abundance reflects changes in sea ice or krill and other food availability, particularly as affected by commercial fishing and by climate change. On this map of the world, the red lines in the Southern Hemisphere represent where penguins come ashore to nest. The northernmost are the Galapagos penguins at the equator. Polar bears, which live north of the Green Line, and other four-legged mammalian predators are part of the reason why small, flightless, ground-nesting seabirds like penguins could not survive in the northern seas. Penguins and polar bears never meet in the wild. With the South Pole at the center, the pale blue areas all around the Southern Hemisphere give another view of where penguins come ashore to nest and rear young. The equatorial Galapagos penguins are at the left. The red spots indicate the areas, including a lot of islands, I have visited to see penguins in the wild. Between 1992 and 2019, I took about a dozen trips that included penguins. The name penguin was originally given to the now extinct great auk, which lived in the northern hemisphere off the coast of Newfoundland, and is pictured here in a painting by John James Audubon. The great auk was an alcid, similar to the puffin, but when European explorers came upon what we know as penguins, probably gentoos, in the southern hemisphere, they named them for their similarity in appearance to the great auk. Whereas alcids, like the puffins on the left, are considered to be more closely related to shorebirds and gulls, the Charadriformes, penguins are believed to be more closely related to albatrosses and petrels, the Procellariformes. The similarity between penguins and puffins is an off-sighted example of convergent evolution. These horned puffins on St. Paul Island in Alaska and this fjordland penguin in New Zealand, also known by its Maori name, Tawaki, are all dark on the back and white on the front, a color pattern called countershading. When swimming in the ocean, birds with this coloration are hard for predators to see from below against the bright sky and from above against the dark ocean. Most penguin species with light colored feet like Tawaki even have black on the backs of their heels and on the soles of their feet to continue the countershading when they stretch out their feet behind them. While swimming, Penguins' feet are not used for paddling, but only for steering and braking. All of their forward motion comes from paddling with their flippers, their adapted wings. Puffins, on the other hand, paddle underwater with their feet as well as with their wings. But unlike penguins, they can still use their wings to fly to nest on cliffs, which helps them evade land predators. Penguins and puffins, both diving birds, 
have solid and not hollow bones to facilitate diving. The penguin's flipper, illustrated on the right, is a highly efficient paddle evolved from the flying bird wing, illustrated by the goose wing skeleton on the left. The goose bones are hollow and thin to lighten their weight for flight. Penguin's solid flipper bones have become thickened and flattened, and the would-be joints are almost completely fused. Their flippers can only be moved from the shoulder, but can twist more than most birds, allowing for forward propulsion with both up and down strokes while they are swimming. The only other birds capable of this type of motion are hummingbirds. But penguin flippers are not just useful for paddling. Penguins use their flippers for balance when walking, like these fat gentoos returning full of fish on Sea Lion Island on the Falklands. or for balance or paddle assist when tobogganing on snow or ice as this emperor, and these at Snow Hill, or this Adelie at Brown Bluff on the Antarctic Peninsula. Flippers are part of the thermoregulatory system of penguins. When the birds get warm, for example, when swimming fast or running to evade predators, like this gentoo coming rapidly ashore on sea lion, the blood vessels in their flippers dilate to expose more surface area to the cool air. This gives a pink color to the underside of the flipper. The blood vessels in their feet also dilate to help with cooling. Flippers are used to express affection as between these Magellanic penguins on Martillo Island in the Beagle Channel in Argentina, or these rockhopper penguins on sea lions or these king penguins courting on Saunders Island in the Falklands. Here, flippers were used for balance and for making a point when this rockhopper encountered a black-browed albatross on its way up the cliff to its colony on Saunders Island. That's probably as big as he can make himself look. The albatross were nesting on the cliff next to the rockhoppers, and once these two got over their surprise, they went on with their respective activities. Rockhoppers can be pretty aggressive, and flipper slapping is another way in which they make use of their solid bones and exceptionally strong flippers. They can also bite with their strong razor-sharp bills, designed primarily for catching fish. The rockhopper on the right flipper slapped its opponent, who in defense grabbed the flipper in its beak. Not everything that penguins do is cute. As those two rockhoppers continued their battle, their open mouths revealed protuberances present in all penguins' mouths, which helped them catch and swallow fish. They even have those protuberances on their tongues, like this emperor. Penguins often get into squabbles, usually over space or a partner. This squabble was by a freshwater stream, and the conflict may have been over access to the prized fresh water. Nearby, another rockhopper was enjoying a drink from the spring. The stream was flowing directly above their colony on Saunders Island. Rockhoppers often position their colonies near fresh water. Penguins can drink and process salt water, eliminating the excess salt from their bloodstreams with a supraorbital gland in their foreheads, like many seabirds. But the number of penguins accessing the stream suggests they will go out of their way for a freshwater drink when it's available. Penguins undergo what is called a catastrophic molt. They lose all their feathers at once, usually once a year. This is a molting king penguin on South Georgia. For penguins, a fully intact feathering is imperative to maintain warmth and waterproofing in the cold sea environment. When their feathers become worn over the course of parenting or being exposed to sunlight, they need fresh ones. Since they can exchange a few feathers at a time, like many birds, and stay warm and dry, they have solved this problem by molting all their feathers at once. The penguin will molt either before or after nesting, depending on the species. But first, it must fatten up by going to sea for a few weeks to gorge on fish, since it will have to fast for the duration of its feather exchange. While the bird is out fattening up, it begins to form new feathers beneath the old. Once it leaves the water and chooses a safe place to undergo its molt, which can even be an iceberg, 
The new feathers push out the old ones. For two to four weeks, depending on the species, the poor penguin looks like a leaky feather pillow. This penguin has its toes turned up, a stance which reduces heat loss through its feet. Another king, also on South Georgia, is further along with its molt and is showing some new feathers. Emperors and kings also replace the colored plates on their bills during the course of the molt. There's an interesting series of studies showing the significance of the orange auricular patches on the sides of the head. When researchers blackened those patches on a male king penguin, he was unable to attract a mate. Partially blackening them delayed that attraction. So those colored head patterns are very important for social recognition as well as for decoration. These are molted king penguin feathers. Penguin short feathers overlap closely, having downy tufts and lots of downy plumules near the base for warmth and a stiff part at the surface. Barbs on both sides of the shaft help hold them tightly together, making them waterproof. The downy part of the base is connected to special muscles, which they can use to control the feathers to trap air for additional insulation and to release that air to improve their speed when swimming. When penguins get oiled, their feathers clump and separate, breaking this insulation and exposing them to hypothermia. That's in addition to getting poisoned by the oil when they try to preen it off. This party humble at Moody Gardens Aquarium in Galveston, Texas, was zipping around in the tank and forcing bubbles from its feathers, visualized in a bubble trail. This mechanism for drag reduction is referred to as air lubrication a phenomenon thought to be used by penguins to shoot rapidly out of water. When a group of penguins enters the water and all release this bubble trail, in addition to giving them speed, it reduces visibility to predators. In this image, the use of the feet as rudders is visible. Also evident is the effectiveness of black on the bottoms of their feet, continuing the countershading on their backs. This Fjordland or Tawaki penguin is just in from the ocean. Like all penguins and many birds, part of its preening routine is to squeeze the uropygial gland at the base of its tail in order to spread the fine waterproofing oil from it onto its feathers. Penguins do a lot of preening, particularly when they return from the ocean. It's a good opportunity to keep their plumage in working order. These are gentoos on Green Rincon Beach on Pebble Island in the Falklands. Preening is necessary even when they land in blowing sand, like these gentoos on Sea Lion Island in the Falklands. Penguins have a layer of fat under their skin for further insulation from the cold. The muscles that control their legs, along with most of the bones and tendons of their upper legs, are higher up inside their bodies, protected by warming fat and feathers. Their feet contain only tendon, bone, and thick skin. To keep their feet and flippers from getting frostbite, they have a countercurrent heat exchange system in the arrangement of their blood vessels. Heat from blood in the arteries supplying the feet and flippers is transferred to colder, colder blood in nearby returning veins to warm it. So while keeping their feet and flippers above freezing, they also prevent their core from getting too cold. The penguins living in colder climates, like these Adelis, also have feathering all the way down their legs and covering much of their bills to keep them warm. On the other hand, occasionally even emperor penguins living on ice need to cool off. The easy solution is to eat snow. Penguins use an ecstatic display call for bonding, as this group of chinstrap penguins is doing on Orne Island in Antarctica. The ecstatic call is often given during, given during nest exchange duty when one of a pair returns from fishing. I have also seen a pair of rock hoppers launch into an ecstatic call when they looked down and saw that the female had just laid an egg. Either could be the case with these gentoos. Pigoshellus penguins like this Adelie at Brown Bluff often build nests of pebbles, which allow for drainage of rain or melting snow. In areas where climate warming has increased the amount of precipitation, penguins have compensated by piling on more pebbles to raise their nests. 
Another Adelie in the same colony is turning its egg. And this one nearby is looking after its two newly hatched chicks. Carrying pebbles to the nest is part of courting and nest building for Pagoshellus penguins, and pilfering pebbles goes with the process. This gentry went about stealing pebbles with impunity from a nearby couple on South Georgia. When they caught and berated him, he stopped, looked around nonchalantly until they were distracted, and then went right back to stealing pebbles with gusto. Penguins are good jumpers and climbers. Seems they can do this as a hobby as well as for a living. I photographed this routine both years that I visited Brown Bluff on the Antarctic Peninsula. These two Adelis gave each other a look of let's go and they climbed up on the chunk of ice, one after the other, and then jumped off first one and then the other, and then waddled off on their way. An Arctic silverfish, here being carried by an Antarctic tern on the Antarctic Peninsula, is one of the food preferences of emperor penguins. Penguins generally eat small fish, krill, squid, and even jellyfish when it's available. Krill, like the pink colored catch of the skate petrel on Deception Island, is consumed by the ton by seabirds, whales, seals, fish, and squid. Penguins that eat krill poop pink, as in this gentoo colony at Coverville on the peninsula. Scientists have been studying satellite photos looking for pink blobs that indicate penguin colonies. Not long ago, such a study revealed a previously unknown Adelie penguin colony of one and a half million birds in the danger islands off the east point of the peninsula. Any discussion of penguins is incomplete without including predators. Lounging on an iceberg near a gentoo colony, indicated by the pink streaks in the background, is a leopard seal, one of their primary predators. One leopard seal can eat at least eight penguins a day. Skuas, another predator, live all around the Antarctic and sub-Antarctic, nesting in the vicinity of penguin colonies and feeding their chicks with spoils gleaned from those colonies. Here's one patrolling the emperor colony at Snow Hill. And this one is flying off with a stolen egg from a rockhopper colony on sea line. Also on sea line, I recorded video of a skua at work. This exposed egg had somehow been cracked. So the Gen 2 penguins were no longer protecting it. I will describe this video before showing it because the action takes place rapidly and I apologize for the wind noise. My intention was just to record the bird on the left placing dirt on his nest, which is typical behavior. Suddenly there's lots of squawking. A skewer flies in to grab the cracked egg. Another skewer tries to steal it, but is chased off. The little bird that flies in to pick up the spoils is a tusset bird, an endemic subspecies of blackish synclodes. Notice that despite agitation, penguins sitting on eggs never leave them uncovered and vulnerable to theft. <laughs> Thank you. 
These snowy sheath bills are nesting and living off a gentoo colony at the British post office at Port Lockroy on the peninsula. They are scavengers that live on penguin poop and fish or krill dropped on the ground by penguins feeding their chicks. They sometimes help that along by pulling on the tail of a penguin during feeding, so it drops some of the regurgitated food. They will also eat penguin eggs or even chicks when the opportunity arises. Southern giant petrels prey on penguins. I watched from a cliff as one intercepted this lone returning rockhopper, always a risky move for a penguin. After I sadly saw the petrel catch the penguin, I went down with a longer lens and a tripod. By the time I got there, there were several giant petrels feeding from the carcass. I have zoomed in on this one to show more clearly the complexity of the tube nose bill structure. The tube serves to channel excreted salt away from their eyes and also helps them smell prey and carrion. When the giant petrels left, striated caracaras, cooperative hunters that live primarily on the Falkland Islands, got their turn only to have to move over again when a giant petrel showed up, most likely a size-related pecking order. In the end, the caracaras flew off with the remains. Kelp gulls also nest near and scavenge or prey on penguin colonies. These were at Brown Bluff. And this one was at Snow Hill. Another penguin predator, an orca or killer whale at Sea Lion Island, boldly came inside the rocks near shore. I was able to photograph this one from the beach. Predators like leopard seals and orca often lurk near landing sites to ambush penguins. Penguins porpoise like this to move faster and to head off predators by interrupting their view from below. The penguins switch course abruptly when they hit the water and never resurface where you expect them, making them a challenge for photographers as well as for predators. These gentoos are coming ashore at Sea Lion not too far from that orca and its pod. Currently about 18 species of penguin or Svenicidae are recognized and they are divided into six genera. The genus Aptonodites, meaning featherless diver, since early observers may have thought their scale-like feathers weren't feathers, includes emperors and kings. They are considered the oldest species, the largest penguins, and have a similar appearance with orange or yellow auricular patches and colored bill plates. King's coloration is brighter and the emperors are nearly twice the weight of kings at about 80 pounds and about 10 inches taller, from three and a half to four feet tall. They both incubate their single egg on their feet covered by a warm flap of belly skin. Emperors nest in the coldest region of Antarctica, indicated in purple, mostly on fast ice, which is ice that is hardened attached to land. And kings, indicated in blue, nest in the more temperate or warmer sub-Antarctic region on land. The Scotia Arc, between the southern tip of South America and the Antarctic Peninsula, is considered geologically a continuation of the South American Andes mountain range all around the Arc. It includes a lot of the areas where penguins nest. The Falkland Islands, just above it, also a haven for penguins, although nearby are not considered part of the Scotia Arc but are geologically more similar to South Africa. They most likely got left behind when the continents split apart. The Drake Passage is the open ocean within the arc. Its opening allows for the Antarctic circumpolar current and strong winds without any land to break them, which can sometimes make for a rough ride through there on a ship. I visited to see penguins all the areas marked on this map, including the Falkland Islands, Martillo Island in the Beagle Channel, which is here, South Georgia, which is the only part of the Scotia Arc that um, is elevated above the waterline, um, and the Antarctic Peninsula. The Snow Hill Emperor Colony is on fast ice attached to the southwest corner of Snow Hill right here. The red marker indicates Ushuaia, the Argentinian port town from which I embarked on at least four of my Antarctic voyages. 
The Allardyce Range of Mountains on South Georgia illustrate the Andes continuation, visible here at St. Andrews Bay. And similarly, the Antarct Andes are the Andes continuation on the Antarctic Peninsula, visible here at Paradise Bay. This was a scene at the Snow Hill Emperor Colony in 2018. The latest census from that year counted around 3,000 breeding pairs there. In the background are icebergs grounded in the fast ice, which function as windbreakers for the colony. An icebreaker was necessary for this trip because the colony is situated on sea ice far from the water's edge. Once the ship was positioned as close as it could safely push into the ice, we flew by helicopter from the ship to a point within walking distance of the colony. Icebreakers do not have stabilizers or keels because those extensions would interfere with their icebreaking capabilities, so they roll a lot in rough seas. Thanks to Mechelzine, I did not get seasick at all on this trip. Our fantastic Russian crew kept the rolling down when they could by tacking as you would a sailboat to adjust their course to the wind. Because of a very rough Drake passage, a lot of tacking added a day in each direction. For the record, Mechlazine does nothing to prevent being thrown against the wall or rolled off the bed while trying to sleep or to stop closet doors suddenly opening and closing on the tip of your finger. Once we landed by helicopter away from the colony, we had to walk a couple of miles to reach it. Emperors returning from fishing accompanied us as we walked toward the colony. They were very curious and both checked us out and followed us. Since they are generally social with other penguins, it appeared that they just thought we were oddly large penguins. To keep up with the hikers, one penguin got down and toboggan. This penguin tobogganed over to a friend of mine, got up and walked up to him and stared into his camera. Emperors, like quite a few penguin species, are very curious. This fellow tested the trail marker flag by braying at it and waiting for a reply. Penguins recognize each other by voice and head patterns, so the non-responsive flag left him a little perplexed. He then stood deciding what to do about a small group of photographers. Of course, you walk toward them and check them out. The penguin went on to test this woman's boots with his feet. When nothing interesting resulted, he moved on. A very small chick is still being protected on its parents' feet. Emperors only feed their own chick, and they only have one chick per season. Males incubate the single egg on top of their feet over the winter, rotating in warming huddles against the driving winds and cold. The incubating males often fast for 115 days or so, including the courting and mating period, followed by about two months of incubating the egg. The females return full of fish after the chick hatches and the males leave to go fishing. The chicks all keep complaining, hoping their parent will be nearby to hear them and feed them. Penguin parents and chicks of most species manage to find each other by the sound of their voices in colonies of hundreds or even thousands of birds. Idle adults stand or lie around on their bellies. Note the beautiful facial patterns and the dense feathering. Emperor penguin eggs are small for the size of the birds and have very, very thick shells, presumably to fortify them against rough weather and handling by tough scaly feet with very, very sharp claws. Notice also how nice warm feathering on this emperor extends down its legs. 
A king penguin holding its egg on its feet will place the flap of skin over the egg, as these are doing to incubate their egg. In contrast with emperors, kings alternate incubation with their mates every 12 to 21 days during a much more temperate time of year. A group of king penguins is about to enter the water at St. Andrews Bay on South Georgia. Penguins frequently enter and exit the water in groups, primarily for safety from predators, but it is also thought that they may help each other find prey. These kings shared the beach with elephant seals, which were pupping, mating, or doing a lot of sleeping. The follow the leader instinct can be taken to the extreme. In 1992, as I was walking on South Georgia with my sister-in-law toward a Zodiac, we turned and discovered this parade of king penguins dutifully following us down the beach. Penguin researcher Gerald Kuiman describes a similar experience with emperors, with one penguin even trying to follow him into the Zodiac. King penguins on Saunders Island in the Falklands share grass with recently shorn sheep. I thought this was unusual until I saw similar situations with penguins in New Zealand. Penguin chicks, such as this young king, have downy feathers to keep them warm, but penguin down is not waterproof and they must molt to adult plumage before entering the water to fish for their own food. Incidentally, early explorers thought these big brown king penguin chicks were a separate species of penguin. King penguins have the longest nesting cycle of any penguin. They hatch their chicks in mid-Antarctic summer, but the chicks don't molt into adult plumage until the following summer. So they must overwinter on land, having to fast or nearly fast for three to five months, depending on food availability for their parents to bring them. They must rely for warmth on their down and huddling together in creches with other chicks. Many do not survive the winter, and after their feeding resumes, the parents take several months to feed them to fledging and then finally undergo their own molt. So a pair of kings can usually produce only two chicks every three years. A couple of these chicks are molting into adult plumage. King penguin chicks grow relatively much bigger than chicks of other penguin species before fledging. Even emperor chicks are only half the size of adults when they molt into waterproof plumage. Since emperors hatch on ice, they have to be ready to enter the water when the ice melts in summer. The genus Pigoschelis or brush-tailed penguins includes Adeli, Chinstrap, and Gentoo species. Adeli penguins, indicated in yellow, share the cold circumpolar region with emperor penguins, although they build pebble nests on ground and often lay two eggs instead of only one. Their nesting calendar is also different from the emperor's. The green spots represent chinstrap penguins, which bracket the 60 degrees south parallel, with climate being warmer north of it than south of it. The red spots represent gentoos, of which more are found in the warmer region. Recently, at least four distinct gentoo populations have been identified based on genetic analysis, with differences in location around all those islands, food preferences, nesting habitat, and physical characteristics. Similar differences exist among king penguins, with two subspecies recognized. The genus Sphiniscus, or banded penguins, live in more temperate climates than Antarctic and subantarctic penguins. These include African, Humboldt, Magellanic, and Galapagos penguins. They manage the warmer climate by nesting in burrows to protect themselves and their chicks from the heat. The pink skin surrounding their bills, which characterizes this genus, is highly vascularized and aids them in dispersing heat. The spots on the bellies of Sphiniscus penguins are unique to every individual. And in an effort to explain the banding or striping down their sides, researchers have introduced penguin-shaped white objects with and without band markings to a tank of fish. It turned out such banding scares and scatters fish, which would make it easier for the penguins to catch them. Penguins are pursuit divers. Galapagos penguins are the northernmost species living at the equator. 
Humboldt are the next species south, living along the coasts of Peru and Chile. I photographed them at Isla Choros off the coast of Chile. Magellanics overlap the Humboldts in part of their range and swing around southern South America into Argentina and the Falkland Islands. I photographed them on Martello Island in the Beagle Channel and on the Falkland Islands. During migration, Magellanics have also been seen as far north as Brazil. There is a large, readily accessible Magellanic colony, which I have not visited, at Punta Tombo on mainland Argentina. As an example of global warming impact, that colony has suffered serious casualties on a single day, unusual hot weather event during nesting season in recent years. African penguins are found on islands off the coast of Namibia and South Africa. They also live on two easily visited mainland colonies near Cape Town, South Africa, which is where I photographed them. Galapagos penguins are very endangered and are currently one of the, the rarest penguin species. Fortunately, efforts made to provide them with additional nesting caves to replace those that have been flooded by sea level rise have been successful. Galapagos penguins have been most seriously impa impacted by El Nino Southern Oscillation warming, suppressing the cold, nutrient-rich Cromwell current, reducing the availability of fish enough to lead to nest abandonment and even starvation of adults. Mostly because of El Nino, their population is now thought to have been reduced to around 4,000 birds, which is less than half the pre-1980s numbers. A small percentage of Galapagos penguins has been found to harbor avian malaria. While they do not seem to exhibit symptoms, there is the concern that in El Nino years, those birds will become further stressed and succumb more easily. On the other hand, captive outdoor penguins in zoos have become so threatened by avian malaria that they are dosed in summer with anti-malaria medication. Avian malaria is not the type that infects humans. On the right is a juvenile Galapagos penguin pictured with the adult that was guarding it. The juveniles lack the distinct facial and side markings of adults. Mangroves, which occur in the tropics and subtropics, are hardly a habitat one would associate with penguins, but here they are in the Galapagos. And this Galapagos penguin is being reflected along with surrounding mangroves. To reach Humboldt penguins on Isla Choros, the penguin preserve off the coast of Chile, we went out in very rough conditions from Punta Choros, a fishing village, in this little boat. Landing on the island is prohibited to protect the penguins, so I had to photograph while bouncing and rotating. Somehow I was still very lucky to get a few photos. Humboldt penguins are threatened by commercial overfishing competing with them for small fish, by illegal explosive fishing, by guano harvesting for fertilizer, by egg theft, and by poaching for food. Like the Galapagos penguins, these are affected by El Nino events, which also results in starvation. A problem for them and for all penguins to various degrees is bycatch in fishing nets. In fact, it is thought that the way some Humboldt seen off the coast of Alaska got there was by having been accidentally caught by fishermen, then kept as pets for a while on board, and ultimately being released up there. Unfortunately, most penguins trapped in fishing nets drown. Seabird guano, or bird poop, accumulates from birds sitting on offshore islands, and penguins burrow in it for protection from weather and from predators. Massive guano harvesting for fertilizer in the late 19th century, and even some taken today, has reduced Humboldt penguin numbers to such an extent that they have not recovered. Currently, there is protection at some sites, including some with walls built by the per Peruvian government protected by full-time guards. There is also a project to provide them with artificial nests in some areas, which has been successful. The current overall population of the species is estimated at around 40,000 birds, down from over 1 million in the mid-19th century. I visited by car in 2016, the mainland African penguin colonies in South Africa at Boulders Beach and Stony Point. 
African penguins, like the Humboldts, have taken a huge hit from guano harvesting from the islands they inhabit. They have also suffered from massive oil spills and overfishing. The spontaneous mainland colonies began relatively recently in 1982, and it is thought that they were the result of the decline of their prey fish near the offshore islands. The oil spill of the year 2000 brought penguin experts from all over the world, and together they saved 90% of 20,000 oiled penguins. Another 20,000 healthy but starving penguins were captured before they could get oiled. They were released nearly 600 miles away so that by the time they returned, the oil near their island had been cleaned up. At Boulder's Beach, you pay an admission fee to walk on a boardwalk to view African penguins. Because these penguins have become a big tourist attraction, the South African government is doing all they can to conserve them. Establishing no-take fishing zones near the colonies has successfully increased the number of penguins. On the other hand, in late 2021, <clears throat> in the first incident of its type, 63 of these penguins died after receiving multiple stings around their eyes and flippers from an angry swarm of honeybees. A park biologist said that usually the penguins and bees coexist and that the bees had probably been disturbed and become aggressive. The unfortunate penguins were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Residents in the area are now asked not to keep honeybees. In one of the parking lots there, you were warned to look for penguins under your vehicle. And a pair of penguins was mating right near the sign. And then emerged and walked into the lot. At Boulder Speech, fiberglass nest boxes provided for the penguins are being used. Amidst the rock formations at Stony Point, an artificial nest co cover is also occupied. And this African penguin at Stony Point has found the perfect condo, complete with a resident rock hyrax or dassy on the roof. This good African penguin parent is guarding two chicks. Another is feeding a chick, and all around the colonies, colony were chicks of different ages. This penguin is even sitting on two eggs. The young penguin on the right is probably being told that he's old enough to catch his own fish. Magellanic penguins dig, mostly dig their own burrows in soil. This one is standing by its burrow on Pebble Island in the Falklands. And this one is there in its burrow. Magellanics will also make use of a man-made option. This was the bottom step of an active staircase at Martillo. This is the view for those penguins returning to the colony on Martillo Island at the very southern tip of Argentina. Tickets for tours to Martillo Island are sold at a kiosk near the docks in Ushuaia. Magellanics sometimes dig a field of burrows. In several burrows, an adult is guarding, and the other may be sitting on eggs or out fishing. This stretching adult shows the markings really well. Magellanics sometimes line their nests with twigs. An immature Magellanic is the one with less distinct markings coming ashore with a group of adults at Martillo Island. This group of Magellanics is going down to the ocean together on sea lion. And when they get there, they are anxious and braying to each other because they know there is a pot of orca just offshore. This is exactly where I photographed the orca in the morning. When you hear them bray, again, I apologize for the wind noise, you will understand why Suniscus penguins have been nicknamed jackass penguins. The once mammalian predator-free New Zealand islands hosted a variety of unusual penguin species. There were a lot of prehistoric penguins, and the oldest fossil, called Waimanu, found there in 1980, is thought to be about 62 million years old. Interestingly, it is thought that it was about that time that penguins split off from albatrosses and petrels. 
The remaining living species are, however, threatened by human activity and by introduced mammalian predators such as possums, stoats, ferrets, hedgehogs, and domestic cats and dogs. To their credit, caring New Zealanders and their excellent Department of Conservation have made inroads into protecting their penguins. The Banks Peninsula on the east coast of the South Island is home to the unique white flippered penguins. Snares penguins live on the Snares Island and the erect crested on the Bounty and Antipodes Islands. Yellow-eyed penguins live offshore on the Auckland Islands and on the south and on the and to the south on the Otago. I'm sorry, they <laughs> live on the Auckland Islands here to the south of the South Island. And they also live on the Otago Peninsula on the mainland or on the South Island. The best views and photos of Fjordlands were from the Wilderness Lodge Lake Meraki near Haast on the west coast. Below New Zealand is Macquarie Island, an Australian territory with kings, rockhoppers, gentoos, and its unique royal penguins. The genus Eudiptula consists primarily of the little blue penguin found along the south coast of Australia and all along the coasts of New Zealand. The little blue on the right was living in the breakwater at St. Kilda Harbor in Melbourne, Australia in 2006. White flippered penguins like the one on the left nest only on the Banks Peninsula and on nearby Mochunai Island in New Zealand. Like the Sphiniscus group, little penguins nest in burrows and they readily take advantage of nest boxes built for them. As of 2012, white flippered penguins, which are slightly larger, lighter colored, and have white all around their flippers, have been considered as a separate subspecies species or color morph of the little blue. However, they are not included in the species count of 18. Chris Challies, who showed us the white flippered penguins at Harris Bay on the Banks Peninsula in 1998, has been studying and conserving the birds for close to three decades. He proudly showed us some chicks illustrating the success of his conservation efforts. In October 29, I went to Flea Bay farther out on the Banks Peninsula. On the right is conservationist and artist, Dr. Lynette Hartley, my excellent New Zealand guide. And on the left is Joey Helps, our guide at Pohatu Penguins. Joey is the daughter of Francis and Shireen Helps, who bought the Flea Bay farm over 30 years ago to raise sheep and discovered that they were sharing land with a large white flippered penguin colony that needed their protection. Joey grew up caring for penguins and sheep. Flea Bay is still a working sheep farm. The lighter color of the white flippered penguin is a close match to these coast, coastal waters, which are colored a turquoise blue by glacial silt washed down from the surrounding mountains. Joey lifted the lid of a box to show us a nesting white flippered penguin. They carefully monitor the penguins, which are very loyal to their numbered boxes, but do not ban them because banding in the wild has been shown to decrease survival. While most of the penguins on the Banks Peninsula are white flippered, like the bird on the right, which only nest once a year, a few of their pairs are mixed with little blues, like the bird on the left, which generally nest twice a year. This has caused some interesting dilemmas, most often when the female is the little blue and wants to nest twice, but the male does not. He will father a second clutch of chicks, but then leaves to fish, returns to molt, and won't help raise them. One little blue female has solved this dilemma successfully by doing her second nesting with a different male, three years in a row. There are around 1,250 nesting pairs on their property in nest boxes, natural burrows, or under houses. New Zealanders have found that these powerful snap traps are the most humane way to eliminate invasive predators like this hedgehog. The genus Megadiptes comprises only one species, the yellow-eyed penguin, also known by its Maori name of Hoiho. This one was on Enderby Island in 1998. In 2019, sitting in a blind, we observed yellow-eyed penguins coming ashore one at a time on the Otago Peninsula. Yellow-eyeds nest in privacy, well out of view of other pairs, which is very unusual for penguins. They will often nest under boulders and roots in the shelter of scrub or low forest so as to be well hidden. 
Their forest nesting hab habitat has been markedly diminished by logging and land clearance for farming. So some low trees called Nagayo have been planted for them and they readily make use of man-made nesting shelters like this one placed under the trees. In contrast with most penguin species, yellow-eyed penguins will not breed in captivity. They are severely threatened by avian diphtheria and more recently by avian malaria. There is currently an effort underway to produce a vaccine against avian diphtheria. Natural predators of these penguins are hookers or New Zealand sea lions, which were between us and the penguins on the beach. As with many penguins, walking up the grassy hill was alternated with hopping. The genus Eudiptes comprises the crested penguins, which are thought to have derived from the yellow-eyed. The crested species include royal, macaroni, fjordland or tawaki, snares, a rat-crested, northern rockhopper or Mosley's penguin, and southern rockhopper with its various races. An odd characteristic of crested penguins is that they lay two eggs of which the first is usually smaller than the second. The smaller egg may be discarded or hatches last and that chick often doesn't survive. If there is an exceptional amount of food available, some of these species will raise both chicks. Royal penguins in blue live only on and around Macquarie Island, whereas mac macaronis in yellow live on islands nowhere near the royals. The Fjordland or Tawaki are in bright green. The snares are just south of them in darker green, and the erect crested are just east of them in lighter green. Southern rockhoppers in their various races are ubiquitous and dark magenta. Northern rockhoppers at the lighter magenta spots live only on a few islands in the Tristan de Cunha group in the Atlantic Ocean and on Amsterdam and St. Paul Island in the Indian Ocean. That is the only species I haven't seen in the, in the wild. Unfortunately, I had to cancel a trip to Tristan because of the pandemic. These affectionate royal penguins were on the beach at Macquarie in 1998. And they were part of a large colony that was pretty much ignoring me. The history of penguins on Macquarie Island is grim. At the beginning of the 20th century, royal and king penguins were melted down for oil. A popular outcry ended this carnage, but only after about 3 million penguins had been slaughtered. In addition, until recently, there was a big problem with introduced rodents on the island, including thousands of rabbits, which were causing erosion. Conservation efforts have eliminated all introduced pests. The penguin population here has largely recovered. Above is a white-faced royal penguin on Macquarie Island in 1998 to compare with the black-faced macaroni that were nesting on South Georgia in 1992. While there has been some debate over whether the royal is just a color morph of the macaroni, most accept them as separate species. They have been known to only very rarely interbreed. This macaroni penguin on Saunders Island is posing in his cleaned up best after a bath. He was part of a single pair of macaronis nesting in the rockhopper colony. Here he is on the left compared with a southern rockhopper. The name macaroni refers to the particularly bright yellow feathers and comes from the name of a given a flamboyant style in 18th century England. It is the same reference as in the familiar Yankee Doodle song. Rockhoppers can walk, but they do a lot of hopping. They also porpoise to get quickly to shore and avoid predators. And once they have arrived near the rocks, they leap out of the water, the closest penguins ever come to flying. Having landed, they scale the rocks to the cliffs where they have their nests. Those rocks have toenail scrapings from hundreds of years of penguins climbing them. Rockhoppers often nest in mixed colonies with imperial, imperial cormorants. An isabelline or brown color variant of rockhopper on Pebble Island in the Falklands is paired with a normal colored mate. 
In New Zealand, Lynette drove us the eight hours across the South Island to the Wilderness Lodge Lake Meraki. Because it was early in the season, we had to contend with a snowstorm as we set out on our drive through the impressive Southern Alps. Dr. Jerry McSweeney and his wife, Ann Saunders, the proprietors of the Wilderness Lodge, have dedicated their lives to ecotourism as a means of conserving the native New Zealand rainforest. A big part of that effort has been protecting the fjordland penguins, which nest in the rainforest. They worked with the New Zealand Department of Conservation to have the beach declared a wildlife refuge so they could keep dogs out. Dogs chase and kill penguins for sport. Jerry led us through rainforest and streams to get to the beach where we didn't have to wait long for the penguins. Tawaki descended from the rainforest where their nests are hidden beneath the roots of trees. This individual shows clearly their characteristic white facial markings, but those markings are not always so evident and their eyes are not always so obviously red either. And they return from the ocean full of fish for their chips. Tawaki nest in loose colonies of only 60 or so birds. There were even two populations coming through this beach. After landing, this Tawaki with attitude stood close by preening on a rock. Recent discoveries by an organization called the Tawaki Project using GPS transmitters attached to these penguins show these birds foraging surprisingly far to the south of New Zealand closer to Antarctica after they have finished nesting. The only explanation so far that they can offer is that they have a vestigial affinity to the area. Our last penguin, JT, I photographed at Moody Gardens Aquarium in Galveston, Texas, the only zoo in the United States that currently has a few of these Northern Rockhopper or Mosley's penguins. They are ones that live only on remote islands in the Atlantic and Indian oceans. The curator, Diane Olson, when she heard that I had seen every other penguin in the wild, generously arranged a penguin encounter guided by one of their biologists. The most distinctive characteristic of northern rockhoppers is their pretty top knot spray of yellow feathers, a more elaborate crest than any of the other Eudyptes penguins. They are also bigger than the southern rockhoppers, and they use different songs in their mating rituals. Unfortunately, their population has declined some 90% since 1950. Some of that is from oil spills, some is from commercial overfishing for squid and octopus, and some is from bycatch and fishing gear. These days, an additional threat is from killing by subanarctic fur seals, whose numbers have rebounded since their decline during the sealing era. They sometimes eat the penguins, but rogue fur seals have killed 100 penguins at a shot and just left the carcasses floating in the water. JT was 28 years old at the time and had almost finished with his molt, explaining the few out of place feathers. I will end with an interesting note told me by the biologist accompanying him. The king penguins we have in the Central Park Zoo came from Moody Gardens, and those birds are descendants of birds they had hatched from eggs brought from South Georgia to start their penguin exhibit over 20 years ago. In fact, you can see seven species of penguins in zif- different zoos around New York City. Here are a few books about penguins, and these books contain further references. In addition, many research papers can be found by searching on the web. Every three or four years, there's an international penguin conference. Abstracts from the conference can also be found on the internet. Penguins, The Ultimate Guide by Tui DeRoy, Mark Jones, and girl Julie Cornthwaite has wonderful photos and chapters written by many penguin experts in addition to the book's authors. It is a great overall reference. A second edition of this book is available for pre-order to be shipped in April. And I highly recommend it. Penguins by Roger Torrey Peterson a classic, is also a good overall reference, although it is older. Peterson called himself a penguin addict, made a dozen or so trips to see them, and was very concerned with their conservation. 
Penguins of the World contains Wayne Lynch's wonderful photos as well as thoroughly researched information about the birds. I have done several photography trips with Wayne as a guide. He earned an MD before deciding to spend most of his life as a wildlife photography guide, but his clear understanding of biology is evident in his writing. Penguins, Natural History and Conservation, edited by Pablo Garcia Borbolio and D. Beresma, is an excellent general reference. The contributors are all serious penguin researchers. Around the World for Penguins by Otto Plantuma is also a good all-around reference with great photos and up-to-date information. Otto has been on two Antarctic trips that I was on. Penguinpedia, by David Solomon, has a lot of tables and interesting information. He also lists where you can find penguins in zoos around the world. Fraser's Penguins by Fen Montaigne describes a long-term study of Adelie penguins and how they've been affected by climate change. The Great Penguin Rescue by Diane DiNapoli is a wonderfully written book about the incredibly successful rescue of African penguins that I mentioned in my talk. 